Hello, everybody. Welcome to our discussion today. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy day, clinic schedule, or uh, being at home and, and logging in to join us. I um, want to welcome you to today's webinar, which is entitled, Let's Talk About Sex Baby, Diagnosis and Management of STIs in Urgent Care. And this webinar is brought to you by EB Medicine and the Urgent Care Association. EB Medicine helps urgent care clinicians get up to speed quickly and stay current on the latest evidence so that you can feel confident treating patients in the urgent care setting. Plus, they make earning CME credit easy and affordable. My name is Dr. Patrick O'Malley, and I'm the course director for the laceration course here at EB Medicine, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. I'd like to thank EB Medicine and the Urgent Care Association again for making this event possible. After the presentation, you'll get to see a brief demo of EB Medicine's resource that is made specifically by and for urgent care clinicians, and it's called Evidence-Based Urgent Care. If you stay till the end, you'll get a special bonus when subscribing. This presentation will be recorded and will be available to everyone who registered within one week. But now on to today's session. I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Benjamin Silverberg. Dr. Silverberg is an associate professor in the departments of emergency medicine and family medicine at West Virginia University. He's also the inaugural medical director of the Division of Physician Assistant Studies within the Department of Human Performance, where he teaches graduate level courses on community medicine and behavioral health. His clinical work includes student health, urgent care and travel medicine, and his areas of academic focus include sexual and mental health and health disparities, all very, very, very important uh, topics. Dr. Silverberg has lectured nationally for the AAFP, the ACHA, and the Urgent Care Association. He's also published multiple articles on topics ranging from infectious diseases to bedside procedures. The presentation is about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a live interactive and an answer session followed by the demo of evidence-based urgent care from EB Medicine. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this lecture and Dr. Silverberg, take it away. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Patrick. I could not have written that better myself. So today we're gonna be talking about STIs and uh, I, I'm not sure that salt and pepper are gonna invite you to rap with them anytime soon, but uh, this is when we kind of show our age in lyrics and the, uh, the folks that were like, I don't know about this topic title. It's 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 pushing the boundaries. Uh, I'm hoping that at least we entertain ourselves as we learn and remind ourselves about sexually transmitted infections and try not to shy away from a potentially uh, sensitive and serious topic. We've got three different learning objectives today, though. I'm going to be talking about the appropriate screening tests and what we should be doing, how often we should be doing that uh, for sexually transmitted infections. We'll talk about actually what happened with the CDC's latest update, which was in 2021, uh, and compare that a little bit to the 2015 update. And we'll also talk about the possible sequelae, what happens when you have STIs that are either untreated or maybe inappropriately treated, and figure out what to do moving forward. Now, I'm going to spoil my presentation on maybe like the second slide here uh, by saying, well, what actually happened since 2015? Here we've got the summary of the 2021 changes, first of which being gonorrhea. Uh, you'll see that the dose of ceftriaxone has actually increased, and it may be even higher than that increase depending on the weight of the patient. Now, this is going to have a trickle-down effect for a whole bunch of other conditions. So when we're considering gonorrhea in our differential, um, or it may have some other kind of impact, this is going to affect a whole bunch of other things. Similarly, chlamydia, the standard of treatment, um, used to be azithromycin. Now we're looking at doxycycline. And part of the reason for this is resistance. Now, there is something to be said for compliance because the azithromycin treatment pathway was much easier, as it were. Uh, it's just a single dose. But doxycycline is the preferred right now. They have also dropped uh, erythromycin and ofloxacin as the alternative regimen. So uh, a little bit of changing there. Now, mycoplasma genitalium treatment guidelines have been clarified. This was something that was kind of mentioned in passing in the 2015 guidelines, but now they actually get some specific attention. We'll go through that today. Bacterial vaginosis and uh, trichomoniasis, one of the big kind of changes is the disulfiram-like reaction with metronidazole has actually been removed. Now, unfortunately, this may still persist in packaging, on certain websites, in kind of the mindset of folks uh, about like, hey, I can't drink alcohol while in this medicine or I'm going to get sick. But that guideline or that recommendation, that concern has actually been uh, 
drugs. Now, also for trichomoniasis specifically, some of the treatment regimens have changed a little bit, and that is going to be um, based on the presenting gender uh, of the patient. And I say that specifically because that is the best guidance that we have through the CDC. They do it based on male, female. Uh, they do not base it on anatomy specifically. So my apologies, I am uh, telling you what the CDC, that language, what they use. And then the last item I'll mention, uh, one of the changes was also scabies, their treatment options have broadened. So that is a very quick run through on the things that we're gonna be talking about today, but what kind of presentation would be complete if we didn't talk about some numbers to begin with? Now, in the United States, gonorrhea and chlamydia, trichomoniasis, syphilis, genital herpes, so specifically herpes type two, um, HPV, uh, hep C, HIV, combined prevalence of close to 68 million. The incidence, over 26 million. And we're looking at, well, just a whole bunch of cases every year. And in fact, one in five people is going to have a sexually transmitted infection. Now, a disproportionate number of those infections is happening in our adolescents and young adults, so our AYA population. Now, part of this may be due to uh, kind of riskier sexual behaviors, not thinking that this could happen to them, not having that life experience of, hey, it's, it's gonna, uh, but thinking, who is having either more sexual contact, who has easier access to it, who has maybe reduced access to healthcare, who hasn't had that world experience. Now, bear in mind, we also don't wanna be ageist in our expectations and assume that every young person is gonna have an STI and every older person is no longer having sex. So even though we are seeing, again, that disproportionate number of younger folks having STIs, don't forget that people at any point in their uh, kind of lifespan could be affected by sexually transmitted infections. And remember, of course, that infections are huge amount of direct medical costs. It's definitely something that we're not gonna be ignoring in urgent care, emergency medicine, primary care, or really any other aspect of medical care. Now, as we talk about the different types of sexually transmitted infections, remember that we're looking at different types. So um, bacterial, of course, is your gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, chancroid, et cetera, but then there's viral infections, parasitic infections, and even fungal infections. Now, there is a overlap um, with things that are going to be sexually transmitted or venereally, if that's a word, transmitted through venereal pathways. There are infections that maybe aren't always sexual. So for instance, scabies could be transmitted in a sexual means, but not always. Same thing with herpes. So if, for instance, someone is a wrestler or someone is uh, engaged in yoga and has a mat uh, at the gym, and there's unfortunately a smear of the herpes virus on that mat, you could very easily pick up herpes gladiatorum. But let's start thinking about the cases that we're going to work through today. So Patrick, depending on how you're feeling, depending on my little chat window to the side, let's, uh, let's see what we can get uh, talking over this lunch hour. Case number one with preventative care, because of course we are full spectrum urgent care docs. We want to make sure that we're caring for our patients in any capacity, any, any opportunity that we have. We've got Natasha. She's 28. She's a cisgender graduate student. And she's coming into urgent care for STI screening. No known exposures, never been in our health system before, so we don't really have any kind of basis uh, for saying when she was last tested, what those results were, um, or really anything on her, uh, her background. But we're comprehensive when we want to say, hey, let's talk about preventative sexual care. So thinking, what things are gonna help guide the recommendations for what screening tests we offer for her, what vaccines or maybe medications would be appropriate, and is there anything different for her 26-year-old boyfriend, Alexei? So I'll give you folks a, a moment to think about that. Patrick, if you wanna jump in with any thoughts, I'll put you in the hot seat, because uh, sure. you're the other one on camera, but I get to see a little bit uh, of the chat as we go. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, being able to sit down and ask detailed, uh, you know, non-leading questions, uh, asking about uh, their sexual activity, uh, what activities they do engage in, uh, what means of protection are being employed. And really important with all these types of discussions is taking that, um, you know, any stigma away and just really having a, a comfortable environment so that you can talk about this just like you're going to be talking about what you're going to be having for lunch. Yeah, honestly, that, that sounds like a great way to approach it. I love that you're trying to destigmatize talk about sexual practice. Uh, I've, I've taken to phrasing this as what body parts are being used with sexual contact. And sometimes you have to clarify what you mean by sexual contact, but it's a way of avoiding like, 
are we talking about penile to vaginal penetrative intercourse, which is just so like, if I say the word rigid, please forgive me for making a pun. But so now the word that's coming to mind is stiff. But my, my point is the, the language could be so clinical that you kind of lose the, the thread and the conversation about it because we don't want it to be so, well, again, formalized that people are not feeling able to use the language that they use for describing their body parts, the sexual um, actions that they're taking uh, and feel more under a microscope rather than saying, I'm gonna have a conver comfortable conversation. So taking a look at some of the CDC's um, uh, guidelines, um, which are very, very similar to the US PSTF. Um, for instance, gonorrhea and chlamydia, we actually have pretty decent guidance on this for women under age 25, um, gonna be testing them. Now the interval is unclear. Um, now women over 25 or 25 and over, um, if they have increased risk, and strangely enough, if they've got more than one partner that is considered increased risk. I tend not to play numbers uh, when we talk about risk. I say, is there a higher number of partners? And I use air quotes because you could have one partner that's got something and 15 partners that don't. Um, sex under the influence of alcohol or other substances, you don't know the status of your partners, um, anonymous partners, things of that nature. Um, so I really try to give examples of what risk might be but have that patient kind of guide me on what their gestalt is and saying, you know, I did something that maybe makes me worried um, because I'm trying to keep them from feeling shame about this. I would rather know that there's something that they're not super um, either proud of or they're worried about rather than really regiment it in a way that makes them feel uncomfortable or not wanting to come forward with that information. Now, one thing that is also uh, interesting there is potentially a uh, retesting of gonorrhea and chlamydia after treatment. Now, this is not a test of cure, but just a shorter term interval. There is a test of cure, however, for uh, chlamydia in our pregnant individuals. Now, I bring this up because sometimes you will see people bounce back to the urgent care in particular, but primary care as well, depending on your clinic's offerings, who are saying, I had a positive test, I got a treatment, I wanna make sure that it's gone. Well, unless you're having symptoms or there's concern for non-compliance with treatment or re-exposure, we probably would wait until three months after to, uh, to test again, because that is not a test of cure. That is just a shorter term interval follow-up. Now, unfortunately for men, there's insufficient evidence to really say whether we should be doing gonorrhea and chlamydia testing, how often there are higher risks potentially. So the idea of men who have sex with men, depending on the sexual practices, Maybe we should be testing them more often, but again, the guidelines are unclear. I set, I set this up by saying, hey, we don't really know what to tell you. Maybe every year, depending on what's going on. And then if you think you need it every three to six months, I probably wouldn't go more often than that. A lot of folks will do it with new um, sexual partners and say, hey, I'm entering into either a new sexual relationship or even a new relationship relationship. Um, let me get tested. Now, HIV and Hep C are a little bit more straightforward. Basically, though the age ranges are a little bit different, all American adults at some point in their adult life test them for HIV, test them for hepatitis C. Now, the intervals may be a little bit more often or a little bit more structured depending on other risk factors, um, but a bit more straightforward. In our clinic or in our health system, we've actually got grants to be able to do this test or these tests with any kind of blood draw. So it does not have to be just for STI screening. I find that also normalizes it a little bit. Then other testing, syphilis. This is one where we have guidance for our men. So sexually active men under age 29, um, men who have sex with men, they should be getting tested annually. Although we also wanna make sure we're not pigeonholing syphilis as a sexually transmitted infection among men who have sex with men. Now I work in a collegiate environment, hepatitis B, most folks are really gonna be immunized against that, but there is again, the screening uh, if folks are at increased risk. Now I power through that because you can look that up very easily we forget about the other things we can do for prophylaxis. So HIV prep, so pre-exposure prophylaxis, medication that can be prescribed to help someone keep their HIV negative serostatus, avoid becoming HIV positive. Now, I work very carefully with that language to make sure that I say, um, you know, changing their, their HIV status because I do not want to imply that being HIV positive is dirty. I do not want to use words like contamination or 
Even sometimes I avoid infection um, because again, we want to destigmatize this language because we want people to be seeking care and then appropriate treatment. HIV PrEP can be either pills that you would take every day, so brand names Truvada, Descovy, there's an injectable, so Operitude, um, there's a um, brand new version of that uh, with dosing that's a little bit different. Uh, Kevoneva, I believe, is the name. Um, I'd say don't quote me on that, but this is recorded, so I, I guess I am quoted. Uh, but that is something that I've just become aware of. So there are all sorts of options, and the recommendation to talk about it has really broadened. So we are now talking about HIV PrEP with everybody, even though not every option is eligible for everybody or vice versa. HIV PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis, after potentially a high-risk encounter, someone would be uh, given different medications to avoid, again, changing their uh, serostatus from negative to positive. Human papillomavirus vaccination is fairly standard, usually beginning age 11 or 12, but it could be as early as age 9. And that ends about age 26, but through shared decision-making could go as late as age 45. Hep A, Hep B, also vaccinations that we would potentially look at. Birth control is considered sexual health prophylaxis, and that includes emergency contraception, and then classic barrier devices and other appropriate personal protective equipment. So whether that means dental dams, whether that means gloves for any kind of um, digital rectal penetration, um, things for sex toys, uh, the list goes on. Quick question. Before we get too far, there Please. was a question here uh, from Judy. Uh, thank you for the question, Judy. It says, but men can spread to women, so why aren't they tested? I think that was referring back to gonorrhea, chlamydia. Yeah, so unfortunately, there is a bit of, how do I phrase this gently, uh, some bias in the guidelines um, insofar as who's going to have symptoms. Um, oftentimes, the infections in men are going to be symptomatic um, and women can be or more likely to be asymptomatic. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, ultimately, I'm, I'm kind of presenting what the, 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 the guidelines have told us. I would love to tell you why they, they phrase it and or they offer these. Um, I agree. Everybody should be getting screened. I don't like playing the gender-based, the uh, sex-based uh, guidelines, as it were. I wish I had better things that are not going to get me in trouble uh, for pontificating on, but I, I will more thoughtfully reflect on that if we've got time at the end. So the guidelines if are, it's okay, the guidelines are what the guidelines they are, are the guidelines. with the limitations yeah. they're in. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, he is a 24-year-old Latino fireman. He's coming into our free clinic, chief concern, dysuria, penile discharge. Um, he's also reporting some mild testicular discomfort, denies any other urogenital issues. He's uncircumcised, uh, unprotected vaginal intercourse, several female partners. So thinking aloud, what are we uh, worried about for him and how might we evaluate his symptoms? Now, just in the interest of time, Patrick, I'll, I, will, I will help you out and Your give point. you a nice little differential. Now, Gonorrhea gets to stand alone. So I'm thinking of, uh, what is it? The farmer in the Dell, the cheese stands alone. Here, the gonorrhea stands alone. And almost everything else is gonna be non-gonococcal urethritis. Kind of drives me crazy, but chlamydia, mycoplasma, urea plasma, trichomoniasis, even herpes simplex um, are considered NGUs. Now, theoretically, urinary tract infections are in our differential. He is uncircumcised. Maybe that's gonna be a, a risk factor, as it were, a predisposing factor. Um, and remember, there's other parts of the, uh, the urogenital system that could be affected. So the prostate, um, as I just hinted, the uh, foreskin, um, so prostatitis, epididymitis, orchitis, balanitis, uh, balanoplastitis, uh, the list goes on. But in his particular case, physical exam is showing a scant premium off-white penile discharge, mild urethral inflammation, uh, doesn't have any skin rash, genital lesions. Uh, testicles are a little bit uncomfortable uh, on palpation, chemisteric reflex is intact. Saying, hey, Bruno, you got some penile discharge. Maybe we should be treating you empirically for gonorrhea and some non-gonococcal urethritis uh, infections. He says, nah, we'll hold off. He is asked to refrain from sexual contact while his urine, gonorrhea, and chlamydia tests are uh, pending. Now, I point out that these are sometimes called dirty urine samples. And again, I want to avoid the language of dirty. Um, the idea is called dirty because you just haven't clean, uh, cleaned off the, uh, the urethra um, or the urethral opening. 
But again, trying to get away from kind of stigmatizing or um, emotional language. Um, but his, uh, his urine tests are going to reveal, unfortunately, gonorrhea. So what do we do with it? Well, for uncomplicated urogenital, rectal, and pharyngeal infections, we're gonna use ceftriaxone as we have in years past, but the dosage is increased. 500 milligrams, and that's just a single shot. Now, if you were to weigh 150 kilos or more, that goes up to a full gram. Now that's approximately what? 330 pounds, I wanna say, if my, my European conversion is correct. Um, but I have to say, I, I don't often get to needing that increased dose. This is the regimen that can also be used during pregnancy. Now, for alternative therapies, either due to stockouts or allergies or what other uh, issues may come in the way, cefixime, gentamicin, plus azithromycin can also be used, except during um, or with pharyngeal infections. Now, if chlamydia has not been excluded, we still do recommend, or the CDC guidelines still recommend uh, treating for that as well. In this particular case, because he had his testing and it came back for gonorrhea, negative for chlamydia, we just treat with a ceftriaxone. Now, unfortunately, here's the sequelae. If you do have that gonorrhea that has not been treated or treated inappropriately, could lead to epididymitis, infertility uh, in folks with um, a uterus, ovaries, uh, PID, disseminated gonococcal infection, plus one STI can beget another. So unfortunately, this can increase risk of either acquiring or even transmitting HIV. Now let's throw kind of a parallel to that and say Elsa, who's 28, she's a foreign exchange student, she's coming into the clinic for STI screening because she got one of those anonymous text messages saying, hey, you should get checked out. And there are websites that do this. Uh, for the most part, I'd like to think that people are not abusing them and either pulling pranks or, or being kind of mean to folks, but you know, it's an anonymous text message. You don't know whether it's really true or not. She's not having any symptoms, and she's also not denying any non-consensual sexual activity. But through a similar workup, we find that she has chlamydia. Now, if she had had symptoms, what might she have experienced, and how is her treatment going to be different compared to gonorrhea? Well, with chlamydia, again, uncomplicated urogenital, rectal, and pharyngeal infections are all going to be treated the same way. In this case, we're looking at doxycycline. So again, azithromycin kind of was the standard before because it was just easier for people to do. You could even watch them take that treatment in clinic, depending on how your clinic was set up. Now, doxycycline, 100 milligrams BID times seven days. The challenge here, doxy is a little bit harder on the belly than some of the other antibiotics, although theoretically all of them can be, and this can be photosensitizing. So uh, depending on what season we're in, depending on your geographic location, people may complain about uh, sunburning more easily. Now, alternative regimens would still be that azithromycin. So if compliance is truly a concern, someone doesn't tolerate doxy. Um, we've also got levofloxacin, but bear in mind there's downsides to that too. So fluoroquinolones, of course, have the risk of spontaneous tendon rupture. Though I tell you that, though we have that black box warning, I've never seen it in my career, very thankfully. Now, pregnant patients can also use azithromycin, but instead of the fluoroquinolone, uh, amoxicillin is an alternative agent. Now, there are certain serovars of chlamydia trachomatis um, that can cause LGV, so uh, lymphogranuloma venarium. This is rare in industrialized countries, but possible, and it's not quite the same thing as an unchecked, gonor excuse me, unchecked chlamydia infection. It's a uh, specific set of serovars that can do it. Now, this is a really good time for us also to talk about expedited partner therapy. So Bruno and Elsa, maybe they knew each other, maybe they didn't, maybe they're in the same cinematic universe, who knows? But EPT is basically a idea that I see a patient in front of me and I'm going to treat their partners empirically. It actually came about with a way, to, or excuse me, as a way to expedite treatment for syphilis. And that's a little bit tricky because syphilis, as we'll remind ourselves, is treated with penicillin as an injection. So it's a lot easier when we're dealing with oral therapies, so chlamydia specifically. You're going to see that it's either permissible or potentially permissible in all 50 states and some, some territories as well. This map is um, accurate as of this past November, and that actually hadn't changed for a couple of years prior to that as well. But Figure out what your local state statutes are and what your level of comfort is. Um, some people will say, here's a prescription that you're going to give to your partners. Um, 
or partner. Uh, some people want actual names to be able to send in a prescription for that uh, person. Some people will actually dispense pills from their, their clinic. So there's different ways that this can be done. Um, and then there's also timeframes. So thinking about treating partners from the last 60 days, or if it's been more than 60 days since the person who has had a confirmed infection um, has had sexual contact, think of the last person um, outside of that 60-day window. Let's look at some other infections, and the differential will get a little bit easier because as I tick off infections, we're not going to use those again. We've got Moana. She's uh, 31. She's a tattoo artist of South Pacific, or, uh, South Pacific Islander heritage. She's coming in with malodorous vaginal discharge, some genital itch, some dysuria, but no vaginal pain or bleeding, and she has, is having unprotected vaginal intercourse with male and female partners. What's in the differential, and what will we do to evaluate? Thoughts? And so I'm also trying to read the chat as I'm going through here too. Yeah, there, we'll there's a lot of really, too. really good questions. So I think we're we're gonna have. Some yeah, good, no, it's good, awesome. Good, I appreciate the engagement. To talk about here, especially with the uh, expedited uh, therapy. Yeah, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Ultimately, I don't want to speak for anyone's practicing behaviors, which is I think part of the reason why some of those states do have that potentially allowed. Uh, and why I encourage you to take a look uh, if you're in one of those potentially allowable states. But, um, and I'm also showing my age with uh, some folks not having paper scripts anymore. So I feel that, I feel that. Um, so thoughts from Moana though, with her malodorous vaginal discharge, I'm seeing trick, I'm seeing uh, candida, uh, BV. Absolutely, these are things that are possible. Gonorrhea and chlamydia, as I already spoiled, we talked about them, so we won't talk about them again. But trick, mycoplasma, ureoplasma, uh, BV, candida, syphilis, chancroid, uh, HSV can actually even cause a discharge, uh, HPV. Now, in her case, pelvic exam showed a foul-smelling, frothy green vaginal discharge. I'm using all of the board words, and I don't mean board, B-O-R-E-D, but B-O-A-R-D, so all of the testable words. Uh, she had a wet mount or a saline mount that showed motile, pear-shaped, flagellated organism, no clue cells, KOH prep showed neither spores nor pseudohyphae. So what are we thinking here? Um, what other tests could have been performed? How would you treat her? Um, are there ways that this infection could have been given to her or she acquired, I should say, through non-sexual means? So here we're actually looking at trick. So I used all the buzzwords with the uh, flagellated organism and the green frothy malodorous discharge. Um, there are point of care tests that you can do for this. So literally a swab, you put it in some reagent and depending on what color that reagent turns with your, your test, that can be positive or negative. You can look under the microscope as was done here. Uh, there's even PCR tests that can be done benchtop. So there's all sorts of uh, ways to test for this as well. Now, typically, and again, I am saying typical, I'm not saying 100%, um, trichomoniasis infections in men are going to be asymptomatic and men are often uh, treated by presumption. So if they had a female partner who tested positive, we are just gonna treat them. There's been a number of times that I've wanted to actually test my guys because they've had symptoms, the penile discharge, dysuria, and we haven't been able to figure out what the issue is and maybe they don't have a female partner um, who has actually got a confirmed infection. So sometimes uh, we will be testing for them. First-line therapy for women is going to be a week's worth of metronidazole. First-line therapy for men is going to be a higher single dose. Yes, this is a difference. Um, there are kind of studies into the longer course being more effective for women, but notice that there is an alternative regimen, unless the uh, patient is pregnant, for doing tinidazole as a single treatment. So it's not that there is punishment per se, but in terms of tissue penetration, it looks like the longer course um, uh, is implied as a better option for folks with vaginal tissue. But again, the guidelines are saying uh, women and men, male, female, it flip-flops between gender and sex. And anyway, I'm soapboxing again. The CDC did take away that uh, warning about disulfiram-like reaction with drinking alcohol but you'll still see it. It's still gonna be on the package insert. So I make a point of it uh, and say, hey, you know, they used to say you can't drink with this medication for a period um, with using it, but they thought that that's actually not true. I'd still be cautious. Now, this is an older table that's comparing BV, candidiasis, and trichomoniasis. 
Usually we talk about BV as having more of a fishy smell. Um, so kind of wiping the swab on the back of your glove and doing the whiff test. That is not, um, not an official uh, dictum, but we still have it persisting in a lot of our records. You'll see those clue cells, which I'll show you in a second. Um, candidiasis, a thick, chunky, cottage cheese-like discharge, pseudohyphae, budding yeast, and then trick, as I kind of gave you the example. So clue cells, pseudohyphae, and the flagellated parasite. I do want to take a moment to specifically call out mycoplasma, though, and mycoplasma genitalium specifically. This is a new and emerging infection that does get a little bit of airtime during the 2021 update. This infection can be asymptomatic, but it could cause cervicitis, PID, infertility, uh, could cause urethritis, especially persistent or recurrent urethritis. Now, unfortunately, it's already got genetic mutations, and that's allowing uh, antimicrobial resistance, specifically to both macrolides, but also fluoroquinolones. So the 2021 guidelines are basing treatment on that antimicrobial resistance. Unfortunately, we don't have commercially available testing for that antimicrobial resistance in the US yet. The technology does exist. Uh, it is using PCR, uh, but we just don't have that FDA approved yet. Now, if we did happen to have antimicrobial testing that showed macrolide resistance, or if we just didn't have that testing available, but we did confirm that there's mycoplasma genitalium, treatment is going to be the doxycycline for a week, followed by moxifloxacin for a week. Now, if we saw that there was macrolide sensitivity, or we couldn't use the moxifloxacin, then it would be sequentially uh, doxycycline and uh, azithromycin. So usually you're going to fall into that first point, that first treatment pathway, because we don't have that antimicrobial testing yet. But stay tuned. This hopefully will be changing soon. And if you're practicing in a different uh, region, country, there may be a little bit of uh, different guidance. Now, I'll also point out that the um, regular regimen for treating PID does not cover mycoplasma. So uh, this is one to consider. And again, stay tuned, not just for instrument uh, or testing purposes, but seeing where this infection goes uh, in terms of both spread, the numbers, and if we need to revise uh, treatment. Now, I do see one question in the side and I wanted to address real quickly. Um, urea plasma, also a real uh, challenge. It was last mentioned in 2015, and there's no mention of it in the 2021 guidelines. So I've had to go back into the 2020, uh, sorry, 2015 guidelines uh, to give some, um, some answers there. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, I'd have to go back and look, but it is treated a little bit differently. I want to say that it was with azithromycin, um, but it was different and it just disappeared from the 2021 guidelines. Let's take another case. We're going to have uh, June. He's, uh, excuse me, they are a 30 year old South Asian trans man. They use they, them pronouns. They're coming in with itching in the general area. They're in the military, recently came back from deployment, but no new soaps, detergents, uh, clothing, not taking hormonal therapy, and have not had phalloplasty. What else might you want to know about them and what is in the differential? Well, as a um, self identified trans individual, we want to think about other things that may be. Uh, performed or done as part of social transitioning or social presentation of their um, identity. So binding the chest, um, prosthetics that are used or packing in the genital area. Um, so other things that could lead to moisture, friction, etc. Now, dermatologic manifestations do occur with a lot of sexually transmitted infections, remembering that not all of the things I've listed here are going to be truly uh, or exclusively transmitted sexually. So candidiasis, tinea chorus or corporis, pubic lice, scabies, uh, the list goes on. I didn't give you enough information in this particular case to really make that diagnosis, but let's talk about scabies. Why do we worry about scabies? We've got the breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, kind of burrow as it were. So mama mite burrows into the skin, lays the eggs, and then as those eggs basically hatch and come back out of the skin, the creatures poop, and we have a hypersensitivity reaction to that. So no one wants to hear that. They feel really gross about it, but that's what those bumps are, is a hypersensitivity reaction. Um, they tend to be really itchy, and they can actually get crusted and, and look pretty awful. Um, I say breakfast, lunch, and dinner because you tend to see kind of three, uh, three bumps in a row. Also tends to be thinner skin, so between the web spacing of the fingers, the backs of the wrist, 
um, the inguinal folds in the groin, armpits. Um, those are the kinds of places that you tend to see, but not exclusively. Permethrin cream tends to still be the standard. It's going to be applied neck down and it's washed off after eight to 14 hours. Now, if you forget why it's done pretty much everywhere and left on for longer, uh, compared to lice, for example, remember that this mite has burrowed into the skin. So it is a more potent cream and it's left on longer because again, it needs that penetration versus lice, it's just on the hair follicle. Uh, it doesn't have to be quite as potent or left on quite as long. There are other treatment options. Uh, I will draw your attention just to the lindane because it is banned in some uh, jurisdictions due to toxicity and really shouldn't be used in kids. Let's talk more about bumps. We've got Jasmine, she's a zoologist, Middle Eastern heritage. She's coming into clinic with painless bumps in the genital tissue. She's never had this issue before. She's not having ulcers. Uh, she is married, she's monogamous, doesn't think that the husband is having any extramarital affairs. Now, the patient can certainly say that. The patient can also say that they're not sexually active. We often will trust them as far as we can throw them. I say this to be a little bit funny, but also to reflect that I want to make sure that we're still trusting our patients, but if we have any doubt, if they have any doubt, maybe we do need to explore this um, and we document. Patient says that they're not sexually active. Why is the pregnancy test positive? Um, where's the kind of disconnect? I think we've all been burned in, in that kind of scenario before. The person says that there is no chance of it being a sexually transmitted infection and lo and behold, uh, we have discovered something that we didn't uh, want or expect. So you have to have those kind of candid conversations. In this particular case though, what else what might we want to know and what is in our differential? Now, in her particular case, if husband is truly monogamous, she's not having any ulcers, maybe we need to think about human papillomavirus. Why is she having these bumps? Has she developed some warts um, or maybe even a, a cancer? We're thinking about our high and our low risk strains, remembering that those anal genital warts, often soft, moist, raised, Sometimes they're even pedunculated, so having that stalk. Um, and they can actually be itchy. They can cause a burning or a discomfort. And sometimes they get caught on clothing or otherwise uh, getting in the way of things. There are multiple treatments that can be performed. I tend to prefer cryotherapy because that can be done in the clinic uh, office. I feel like there's good amount of control. We actually use a cryo tank and then a autoclavable tip to directly apply. A lot of clinics will also use sprays. Uh, you can do surgical removal. You can do certain types of acid. There's even patient applied treatments. So the potophyllox, uh, miquimod. Um, I don't love those quite as much, mainly because I like to have control, uh, at least with these, um, these treatments. Similarly, molluscum, molluscum contagiosum caused by pox virus. These tend to be a little bit well, prettier looking as it were, smooth, shiny with a central umbilication. And again, that buzzword of having that little central divot, they kind of look like a pumpkin with that you know, push in in the middle. Treatment, again, lots of mechanical methods or topical irritants, so very similar to um, what was mentioned on the previous slide. Um, we've got some examples here on different tonalities of skin. If it is in the genital area, could it have been transmitted through sexual contact? Absolutely, but there are other ways. So if you see this in a child, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's sexual abuse or um, concerns uh, of that nature, but you also can't rule it out. I've definitely seen this in my, uh, my guys that are engaged in contact sports or other folks that have skin-to-skin -skin contact. Now, one comment also uh, that I'm seeing on the side, have we ruled out razor bumps from shaving uh, the genital area? Absolutely not, and thank you for bringing that up. I don't mention it in these slides, but razor bumps, ingrown hair, uh, folliculitis, absolutely valid, great point. Especially with something like molluscum, when you start disrupting the molluscum papule, um, you are potentially going to spread the virus. If someone were to squeeze onto this, they'll get kind of a waxy-like material, there's viral material in there and that's part of how it spreads. So if someone were to still be shaving, trimming uh, the pubic hair, either with um, a disposable razor, or even clippers, they could also spread. Um, and then shaving, trimming can also uh, cause skin infection. So wonderful question, thank you for that. Let's talk also about another bump that, man, it looks like everything. Mpox, formerly known as monkeypox, another virus, skin to skin contact, but, Let's make it complicated and have it spread through respiratory secretions, shared surfaces. Um, 
oh, this was a nightmare for, for a little while. And this was on the heels of, of COVID's real heat. We were seeing this with both penetrative and non-penetrative sexual contact. There's sex toys, linens, hugging and kissing could spread this. So, oh my God, I hated this for, for a while. But MPOX, apart from its name change, isn't really all that new. It just had some kind of outbreak pockets uh, in recent history. The incubation period, which is usually not contagious, is gonna last about seven to 14 days, but then it has that nonspecific flu-like prodrome, lymphadenopathy, and then you start to have these papulovesicular and pustular lesions. The infection itself is gonna last about two to four weeks, resolves on its own, and the 2022 outbreak usually did not cause fatal illness, but there were some cases in folks with other things that were going on. Now, I do want to bring up vaccination, um, the brand name Geneos. Um, there were increased opportunities for that, usually through health departments. To extend supplies of that vaccine, instead of doing it as a um, intramuscular, it could also be offered as a um, intradermal. Um, that was a way of kind of extending the amount uh, of people or the number of people that could be vaccinated. The downside with doing an intradermal injection is it would uh, lead to skin hyperpigmentation. Um, it could be a little bit more scarring in that way. So just one thing to warn your patients if they go that route. There are antiviral medications as well that could be used with MPOX, but really need um, guidance there. Pictures. Oh, it looks like everything. Um, MPOX looked like a pustule. It looked like molluscum. It looked like ingrown hair. Um, it was a tough one. When in doubt, you had to get all gowned up and send it off to the, the labs. Um, but this was a tricky one. Less tricky, though, a nice summary of the visual um, diagnosis. So tinea cura, so jock itch, or a fungal infection into the groin. You see that scalloped edge, pubic lice that I hinted at before. So you can literally, literally see those little crabs looking back at you, usually moving. Uh, scabies can be in the general area. As I said, thinner skin, so the skin of the... Um, the foreskin, uh, the scrotum, genital herpes, oh, that hurts. These are the ulcers. So passing urine over those ulcers can really sting or burn. Genital warts and then molluscum. Now, syphilis, I'm not going to go too deeply into other than to say that with testing, you've got your non-treponemal tests and your treponemal tests. Um, we classically were doing this as the non-treponemal first. And if that was positive, then we go on to confirm that there was a treponemal um, uh, antibody. There is the reverse algorithm, which actually I'm going to show you on this slide, which looks frankly a little bit more complicated. It's kind of sequence B, so the uh, yellow um, the yellow boxes, but it is thought to be actually a bit more cost savings because it is uh, a little bit less labor intensive. So um, you've got your classic algorithm, you've got your reverse. It depends on your institution, but there are ways to do it and then interpret those results. The staging as well as the treatment for syphilis really has not changed in decades upon decades. Primary, secondary, latent, tertiary, and then neurosyphilis or um, those kind of end organ infections. Um, starting out with the painless chancre, leading to the rash in the palms and soles, then being latent for a particular period of time. The period of time of latency really varies by whether you're using CDC or WHO guidelines. And then you get your tertiary manifestations, which can look really gnarly. So you've got your chancre on here, the shaft of the penis, the uh, syphilitic uh, dermatitis with the rash in the palms and soles. And then that gumma is uh, super unpleasant. Um, just reminds me of Halloween masks, honestly. They're really disfiguring uh, erosions, necrotic lesions. Um, this is one of the face, um, but, but pretty, pretty gnarly. Treatment, uh, penicillin hasn't really changed. Let's try to get close to the end with Loki. Um, he's coming into the clinic with painful sores on the shaft of his penis. He engages in penetrative and receptive anal intercourse with male partners, inconsistent condom use. What do we want to know? What's in our differential and how would we further evaluate? Well, you notice we haven't talked about herpes yet, so let's do it. There's two different ways that we can test for herpes. We've got a swab of an active lesion, but we've also got blood testing. Now, the downside with blood testing is sure, it will tell me the difference between uh, HSV1 and HSV2. HSV1, usually being in the mouth, but because of oral sex, can also be found in the genital tissue. HSV2 is usually in the genital tissue, but it doesn't say who gave it to you, doesn't say when they did, doesn't say when and if you're going to have an outbreak. 
I liken that to telling someone that there's a bomb in their house. They didn't, they don't hear who put it there. They didn't say where it is. They don't know when it's going to go off or if it's going to go off. So it tends to stress people out. Not my favorite test. Talk about that uh, kind of transparently with the patient um, and see, is this a test you really want to pursue? I tend to prefer that swab because it's telling you what that active lesion is. Bearing in mind, there, there is still a risk of false negatives, especially if that lesion is pretty early in the onset when it's um, still small or it's already crusted and is healing. Now, notice that cold sores, so herpes labialis, so the oral lesions right at that vermilion border, and herpes gladiatorum, these are usually going to be treated, or excuse me, uh, caused by uh, herpes simplex type 1, and they are treated a little bit differently. Treatment for herpes in the genital area just depends whether it's the first episode, whether it's a recurrence, or if they need to undergo daily suppressive therapy. One thing that I'll make mention of as well, topical analgesia. So as I hinted at before, ulcers in the general area, urine passing over that can really hurt. Um, so maybe consider doing a benzocaine spray. Now here in the US, our standard tends to be Valtrex when we're using the antivirals. Uh, acyclovir was kind of what we used to use because it was generic and cheap, but now that Valtrex is, uh, or Valacyclovir, excuse me, uh, is generic, that tends to be the go-to. Uh, but famcyclovir um, is more used in like Oceana, and the dosages are not directly comparable, which is part of the reason why I think they prefer famcyclovir there. This table is just showing you incubation and um, detection windows, as it were. So taking a look to say, I may not be able to detect an infection. I may not have symptoms for a particular period of time. This is actually from one of the monographs in the EB Medicine um, I'll document on sexually transmitted infections. I think it's really helpful to help uh, patients understand, I'm testing now, why, why might, might I need to get tested in the future? Or when might I need to? Complications, um, balanopastitis, so infection of the glands penis, the foreskin. Well, maybe if uh, there's gonorrhea and chlamydia that was untreated, if they've got a yeast infection. Epididymitis, depends on what their sexual practice is. The guidelines are often going to be age-based, so under age 35 saying, hey, it's going to be gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, over age 35, it's going to be um, an enteric flora, but depends on their sexual practice. Please don't follow it by just age. See what the patient is actually engaged in. Uh, prostatitis, proctitis, um, all sorts of other uh, places that infections can wreak havoc, as it were. Cervicitis, PID, DGI, and LGB, uh, we've kind of hinted at. Now, we're, we're getting close to the end, but I think I'd be remiss not to talk about sexual assault and just remind us that forensic uh, medical care is something that most of us are not trained in doing. And it's not even a question of being empathetic to the patient, but there is a chain of custody when it comes to, well, evidence of sexual violence and sexual assault. This is usually best handled with a sane nurse. Uh, so that stands for sexual assault nurse examiner. Um, Sometimes they're called a SAFE, so a sexual assault uh, forensic examiner. This is usually done in uh, the emergency department. Depending on what the patient wants to do, um, appropriate empiric treatment for bacterial sexually, infection, bacterial sexually transmitted infections would be the ceftriaxone, the doxycycline, and potentially metronidazole if they have a vagina. NPEP, so um, non-occupational HIV post-exposure prophylaxis, the mouthful, um, can also be instituted if the patient is seeking care within 72 hours of exposure. We got through all of that. I know there's going to be questions. I'm going to leave the plain language summary up here just to kind of soak uh, or remind us of what we talked about. But let me open it up to questions if we have got time, because <laughs> we, we got did. through a whole bunch of material very quickly. We do. We, uh, and, and Dr. Silverberg, thanks for the, for the presentation. Thank we do have a lot of questions, so we'll jump right over there. Uh, and uh, and answer some of those. If you can click on the little question uh, box and pick we'll a this. question or two for you to answer. Ooh, I feel like I've got such power here. This is amazing. Um, all right. So I tell you what, I'm I'm not uh, not picking any favorites because I I see the questions before the names. All right. Let's jump into the question about Natasha. So going back to the beginning, um, will screening be covered under Natasha's insurance? Or will she uh, need to pay out of pocket as she is over 25? That is a wonderful question. Um, partially, it's going to depend on her insurance. Partially, going to depend on how you code. 
So if we are evaluating for symptoms, for example, usually we're going to end up with a little bit better coverage. Um, me, myself, I will tell patients like, hey, this is how I'm going to code it because we don't have symptoms in this particular case. This is the standard of care um, for, uh, for what your risk factors are. So you are at risk of this or um, we're just doing the screening because you wanted to. Um, and if you come back with a big bill, please let us know and we'll figure out other ways to approach this in the future. So I hate to say it, but for me, it's usually easier to say, let's try it this way. And if it's a problem, let me know and we'll figure out how to do it differently next time. Um, we have the privilege of having the health department just down the road from us, so we get to use them when there's a doubt. Um, usually I'll say, hey, I don't know. Um, we could try doing it today, or if you would rather uh, pursue testing at this facility, this may be a, a place to do it. So I don't want to say definitively because this is one, always changing, and two, it's often insurance dependent. Um, and even if something is technically justified by the screening recommendations, so USPSTF or otherwise, I'm going to wager that people will have different experiences based on, uh, based on insurance and how things are coded. So me, myself, I just do SCI screening or at risk of and go from there. And I haven't received too much flack back from that. All right. How about uh, uh, one more question, uh, Clinet, with, with EPT? I think that this, you mm -hmm. know, that definitely raises uh, probably another hour long discussion. Uh, but looks at Dr. Toscano, knowing the partner's allergies, their medication list, it seems mm -hmm. like we open ourselves up to a lot of potential yeah. problems when you start prescribing for somebody that you do not know or see. Yeah. So this is why I was really trying to avoid making a dictum to y'all. Um, what I am comfortable with and what you are comfortable with is not captured in either my presentation or the guidelines. So, you know, I'm not precepting you. I'm not here to tell you the single answer. If you are not comfortable doing expedited partner therapy, don't do that. It is a thought that you can do this in all the states and in some of the states that are uh, potentially allowable um, under certain circumstances. So the way that I have handled this is um, finding out the name and the birth date, um, and then either if I can get a hold of that particular person saying, hey, um, this is a scenario, either you were exposed or if they know and the, the person who has been confirmed to have an infection uh, consents to me saying, you know, hey, this person uh, had this diagnosis and we want to make sure that you're safe, have that conversation with that person, um, with the, the partner, um, any allergies that you're aware of, et cetera, et cetera. If for whatever reason I can't get a hold of that person, I might even talk to the pharmacy and just say, hey, it's Dr. Ben, I'm calling over from uh, Suncrest Urgent Care. Um, we wanted to institute this medication for this person. Uh, can you just take a look and see if they've got any allergies on your file? Okay. Um, so that's kind of a workaround as well. But I absolutely recognize that sight unseen can be tricky. Um, I'm usually happier when the person at least can come into my clinic, I can lay eyes on them, see that they exist even if I don't charge them for a visit. Yep. Okay. Well, I think we're going to, we're going to wrap up the Q and a session here and I want to encourage everybody and Dr. Silverberg, thank you so much. This has been a, a great, very Pleasure. informative uh, and timely. I mean, we see these things all the time, so it's important to be up to speed uh, whether yeah. you're in uh, urgent care or the emergency department, this is just part of our practice. So I want to invite everybody to join our private Facebook book, uh, Facebook group, which is uh, called EBM for Evidence-Based Medicine, EBM Urgent Care Clinicians. And Val is going to put a link to that in the chat um, for people to come in and continue this conversation. We, we post a lot of educational content, uh, give people a safe forum to be able to come in and ask questions and just share insights from across the country from different uh, practice environments. Uh, but for the last few minutes, what I want to do is jump in and just start uh, to, to give you a little bit of information about uh, the new resource from EB Medicine called Evidence-Based Urgent Care. Uh, this was designed uh, from input uh, from the Urgent Care Association and the College of Urgent Care Medicine. Uh, if you've got any questions during that demo, please put those in the Q&A session and I'll try to answer those. Um, if you like what you see, you can click on the link on the screen or in the chat to uh, to learn more and subscribe. So I am going to share my screen here. And 
screen and okay. All right, so when you sign into EB Medicine as a customer, uh, you are able to view whatever um, products that you have and we're gonna click on evidence-based urgent care and sharing this tab right here. So evidence-based urgent care has been around now for two years. There are 24 topics and it's essentially, it's a deep dive into one clinical topic per month. Uh, as the name suggests, it takes an evidence-based approach and you can see some of the issues here, you know, tick-borne illnesses, dental emergencies, community acquired pneumonia. Uh, but lo and behold, we have a full issue on the topic that we discussed today, which is the diagnosis and treatment of STIs in urgent care. So I'm going to click on this just to give a little uh, test drive through an issue. Um, if we look at the table of contents on the left, it really takes you through um, an, an entire patient encounter with case presentations, introduction, a really good overview of the pathophysiology associated with each clinical entity that's discussed each month, differential diagnoses. So you can jump, you can actually use this as a point of care reference uh, by pulling out the table of contents and going directly to wherever you want to go. Another thing that really separates this from, uh, from other resources is the fact that it, that it was developed by and for urgent care clinicians. So much of what we rely on in the urgent care setting is either emergency medicine based or family medicine based. And this really does take into account the, uh, you know, some of the limitations that we've got in the urgent care setting where we don't have, you know, everybody gets a CT scan and you've got consultants that are available to you left and right. So it really is an urgent care specific approach. Uh, the diagnostic studies that you are likely to have available, recommended treatments. Um, there's also, uh, discussion on special populations, uh, when it's relevant for that particular topic, controversies. Uh, there's also, and I think that this is one of the, the things that is really, really a, a, a strong point of this resource, is the risk management pitfalls. These are the things that we're supposed to learn, but nobody ever teaches us. And sometimes they just come from the school of hard knocks, and none of us want to get that, uh, that discussion a couple of days later. Hey, you remember that patient that you saw? Uh, and you know, it's automatic, the uh, pit in your stomach feeling. So the risk management pitfalls are a great way to reinforce a lot of the learning and hopefully prevent you from getting in trouble. Other things uh, to take note of are the charting and coding so that you and your clinic get reimbursed for what you do. So there's a strong emphasis on the documentation, the medical decision making uh, that's included with each topic. And then lastly, just to uh, summarize, so we've also got a clinical pathway that is included for each uh, month's topic. So these are things that a lot of the, the groups that we work with, they actually print these off, they laminate them, and they try to get everybody practicing uh, you know, from, from the same standard, uh, so that if you're going into clinic one versus clinic two, you're going to get the same type of care regardless of where you go. And then lastly, it is evidence-based medicine. So you can see that each issue is highly referenced so that you can go and dig deeper. Uh, you know, if you ever wanted to in incorporate kind of a journal club format, uh, this is a great way to be able to pick some articles and uh, and really take an even deeper dive uh, by implementing that into your group's practice. So that is a quick run through of evidence-based urgent care. If anybody, let's see if there's any questions here on that. There do not appear to be. Let's see here. Okay. So I think that we will be able to uh, to wrap up. So one thing that I do want to share with you is a special offer for evidence-based urgent care right here. Okay. So let me just mention this real quickly. Um, if you are interested in checking out evidence-based urgent care and getting, you know, taking a step forward with your clinical education, you can use this coupon code, which is webinar28. Uh, that will give you access to all issues moving forward, as well as the whole library of issues that have already been released. We've got the clinical pathways, the charting pearls, 
Uh, each issue does come with four CME credits. So over the course of a year, you could uh, earn uh, you know, up over 48 hours of, of credit and you are able to access the CME for the previous issues that have already been released. There is a mobile app, you can access it there as well. So that wraps up the demo of evidence-based urgent care, our talk on STIs with Dr. Silverberg. And we hope that you enjoyed this event that was sponsored both by EB Medicine and the Urgent Care Association. Again, um, you know, thanks for staying all the way until the end. We've only gone over by one minute, so that's pretty good. Um, you can use that okay. webinar 28 to get 20% off uh, the evidence-based urgent care subscription. This offer does not last indefinitely. So please uh, consider uh, acting quickly on that. Uh, but I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And a big thanks to Dr. Silverberg for being our expert, a true expert on this content matter and providing us with a really terrific presentation. We appreciate your time, uh, effort, and energy in putting all of that together. Uh, everyone who registered for this event, regardless if you were able to make it live, you will receive an email with a link to the recording within the next seven days. And you can always come into the EB Medicine uh, private Facebook group and ask additional questions and provide some comments. Again, thank you for attending. Don't forget to take advantage of the discount using the code webinar28. And to close out here, uh, thank you again for being here. You can just close your browser window and hope that you all have a great rest of your day and week. Thanks to everybody for joining.